Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I'm David Bansuri, President and CEO of the State Collaborative on Performing Education. I'm also joined today by Dr. Sharon Roberts, SCORE's Chief K-12 Impact Officer. We want to welcome you to today's SCORE Institute, which is focused on summer learning experiences that work for students. And our hope today is to share key examples and best practices around how Tennessee can maximize the potential of summer programming as an essential learning recovery and acceleration practice that enables students to feel academically prepared when they enter the classroom in fall of 2021. Whether you're an educator, a district leader, a school leader, a community partner, a parent, or someone just interested in education, we hope you'll see this webinar as part of the larger conversation on how we can revitalize and strengthen our education system as the state recovers from the pandemic. As you all know, just over a year ago, Tennessee schools were unexpectedly forced to close in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Over the past 12 months, educators and district leaders have gone above and beyond the call of duty to ensure every student across our state was being served. Despite an unprecedented crisis, the Tennessee education system has proven its resilience and been a leader in the nation for innovative recovery. Yes, David. Um, our Tennessee districts have done incredible work making sure every student, whether in person, virtual, or hybrid, have had access to high quality learning opportunities. I am continually amazed, but never surprised, at educators' abilities to adapt and grow in the face of challenges and continually innovating practices to keep students engaged in learning. It's because of these efforts that some of the worst predictions on pandemic related student learning loss have not yet been realized here in Tennessee. So thank you to all of the educators, leaders and partners for all of your hard work, especially now, as I know many of you are in the thick of testing in addition to planning for summer learning. Thanks to each of you for remaining student centered and optimistic despite the tremendous challenges presented over the last year. As we continue to recover, we have to capitalize on every opportunity to provide high quality instruction and ensure students are on track moving into the 2021-2022 academic year. High quality summer learning this year will be a critical lever to accelerate student learning and target instruction to students who have been most affected by the pandemic. The information I'm going to review quickly will not be new to the folks on this webinar, but I do want to take some time to quickly review what the student experience looked like this year. We know that Black and Hispanic students disproportionately did not have in-person learning options or did not choose them out of concern for student and family safety. Economically disadvantaged students were more likely to face digital divide challenges, which contributed to challenges around engaging with learning. Both of these trends contribute to initial evidence of learning loss that we'll learn more about in the coming months through the state's annual assessments. There are also signs that these challenges are not limited to K-12 learning outcomes, as we saw a nearly 20 percentage point drop in student community college enrollment. As example of losing students, an example, excuse me, of losing students at a key transition point in education. And these trends are reflected in the networks of districts that SCORE works closely with who report decreases in student enrollment, especially for students in pre-kindergarten and kindergarten, high levels of disengagement in virtual learning and increases in chronic absenteeism, interruptions to in-person learning due to cases of COVID in schools, and challenges in facilitating key learning that is best done in person, such as teaching students in early grades to read. We also know Tennessee is in a strong position to address many of the issues given recent actions from state leadership. We're well poised to act swiftly and comprehensively to make up for some of the losses that we've seen. For example, Tennessee was the first state in the country to adopt recovery policies during the January special session of the legislature, offering K-8 students multiple weeks of summer learning camps focused on English and math instruction, supporting the expansion of high dosage tutoring, grounding early literacy instruction in phonics, and preserving our statewide assessments to provide key data to inform recovery efforts. Tennessee will receive $2.5 billion in federal funds to aid recovery 
adding to a total of four billion or an average of four thousand dollars per public school student in the state. This provides an opportunity to the state and its districts to maximize the potential of this funding to accelerate student learning and give an example of what's possible. Given this context, it's important we talk about the potential of summer learning camps as a key strategy for recovering and accelerating learning this year, and as an ongoing practice to prevent summer slide. I know from personal experience that summer school is not often seen as an exciting opportunity for students. For many students, being at school during the hard earned summer vacation is not ideal. Further, planning for summer learning is a tremendous undertaking for teachers and leaders. And that's in a normal year when we aren't facing high levels of fatigue. But while the concept of summer school is not new to any of us, I want to emphasize a few key differences between the summer learning camps that we are discussing today and what may typically come to mind when we hear summer school. In the past, summer learning has typically been seen as a compulsory program for students to recover credit. However, this, this year, summer learning camps are optional for students, which makes it critical for districts to take the time to build a why for students and families to engage in learning over the summer. We've seen that done well before in our state. For several years, we hosted Read to Be Ready summer camps. Students showed up, and despite the fact that these opportunities were optional, they came, so we must do it again. I also want to acknowledge that this timeline is difficult. Although our legislator came together as early as possible to allocate funding for this opportunity, planning learning on this timeline in a year like you all have had with so many competing priorities is difficult to say the very least. And beyond that, the breadth and depth of student need is vast, but we know that accelerating student learning is more needed than ever, and that we have an opportunity to make the most of this time to recover learning and prevent summer slide. So our goal today is to provide you with some tangible resources that you can take and use to support your planning. We've talked to national experts, as well as districts across the state, pull together best practices for leveraging the existing high quality instructional materials you have to lead powerful and deep learning for students this summer. I'm going to quickly walk through our agenda for today. In just a moment, I'm going to pass the mic to my colleague, Courtney Bell, Senior Director of Research and Innovation at SCORE, who will walk us through some of those key principles and best practices to maximize summer learning for all students. I'm also honored today to have Dr. Clint Satterfield, Millicent Smith, Shannon Tufts, and Lauren Effler share real examples of Tennessee districts who've been working diligently to plan their summer programming. As you'll hear from them today, summer learning is a key opportunity to leverage high quality instructional materials to deliver top tier instruction to our students. Following presentations from each of these experts and leaders, We'll have a moderated Q&A led by Courtney Bell. We'll encourage you to submit questions as you have them using the Q&A function on Zoom. After this webinar, we'll share some standards aligned resources for districts and school leaders who are planning summer, summer learning, as well as some opportunities for additional consultation support from national experts for districts who would like that. So on behalf of the SCORE team and the students who have and will continue to benefit from your hard work and commitment to improvement, thank you for taking the time to learn with us today and for being with us for this important conversation. Thank you, David. As we get started, I want to begin with a quick opportunity to engage you by asking two questions about where you currently are in the planning process for summer learning. On your screen, you should be able to see two multiple choice questions that we'd love your feedback on. Later in the webinar, we're gonna ask you about specific aspects of summer learning. So question one, how far along is your district or school in planning for summer learning? Your choices are, we have finalized our plans. 
we are very far along in the planning process. We have taken some steps for summer learning. We have begun thinking about summer learning. We haven't started planning for summer learning. And question two, if you've started planning for summer, what specific steps has your district taken or are you currently taking? Your choices are identifying materials and curriculum, planning scope and sequence, recruitment and staffing, training teachers and staff, procuring and printing materials, forming community partnerships, and logistical planning, including transportation, nutrition, et cetera. Give everybody a second to make your choices and submit those. So let's see the poll results. All right, I'm just taking a quick look at those and we can see that most people on the call are pretty far along in the process um, or have finished them and everybody's working hard on it. Um, and then um, with regard to needs that you have, it's around materials and curriculum seems to be very strong in, and um, recruitment and staffing and logistical planning. So we're kind of all across the board there. And that's why hopefully you're here today. And um, I appreciate the range of experiences that are out there in the field. Uh, I know that our speakers that you're gonna hear from today will appreciate knowing where you are and your thinking as we really dive in together into the information and examples today. Now I'm excited to turn things over to Courtney Bell, Senior Director of Research and Innovation here at SCORE who will share some more context about how districts can start planning for summer learning, leveraging high quality instructional materials. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, so we know that since spring 2020, students across the state have experienced significant disruptions to their learning and inconsistent access to opportunity due to school closures, internet connectivity, quarantine time, constant shifting of instructional models, and summer learning really provides an opportunity to address learning loss and accelerate learning for students who are struggling academically as a result of those disruptions. The Tennessee Learning Loss Remediation and Student Acceleration Act requires districts to provide specific summer learning opportunities to address learning loss. Those include the summer learning camps for graduating kindergarten through fourth grade students, um, which the expectation is for those to be hosted five days a week for six weeks, with six hours of daily programming, including two hours of ELA, two hours of math, and one hour of intervention. Um, there will also be learning loss bridge camps for graduating fifth through seventh grade students, which will be offered five days a week for four weeks, and will also include six hours of daily programming, including two hours of ELA, two hours of math, and one hour of intervention. Now, to maximize the impact of these experiences and ensure that learning is accelerated for our students who are struggling the most, it will be critical that districts and schools prioritize challenging and engaging content that will bring students back to grade level. Today, we're going to be sharing our recommendations for leveraging your adopted high quality instructional materials to ensure rigorous content that accelerates learning. These recommendations are based on a review of recommendations from experts in the field nationally, with many of them being drawn from TNTP, who has released some very strong guidance that we'll be sharing after this webinar. Now, the recommendations we're about to share assume that your district or school is currently implementing high-quality, standards-aligned instructional materials for both math and ELA. And if that is the case, we recommend leveraging those materials strategically to address learning loss and accelerate student learning uh, throughout summer school instead of purchasing or trying to develop something different. Given the short timeline for planning, it will be difficult to get teachers trained and ready for a brand new curriculum. So leveraging the strong resources you already have in place lowers the burden for teachers and ensures continuity and learning for students. We know that teachers are facing fatigue so supplying them with a strong scope and sequence that builds on the learning they've been leading takes some of the pressure off of them for summer planning. And if you aren't sure whether your curriculum choices align with Tennessee standards, uh, edreports.org is a great place to check out. 
And if you already have high quality instructional materials in place, an important first step is to identify where your teachers currently are in the grade level curriculum. Uh, and we know that sometimes pacing can, can vary from building to building or classroom to classroom, um, but if it varies significantly, our recommendation would be to create a plan to get teachers to similar pacing points by the end of the school year. We know that students will be in mixed groups for summer learning, so this ensures that to the greatest extent possible, they're starting from the same place. However, if teachers won't complete the scope and sequence of instruction for the school year, we would recommend continuing with that grade level content during summer school. Next, we're gonna talk specifically about early grades ELA. So if teachers will have completed their scope and sequence, uh, that's where we're gonna have to get a little bit creative. So the recommendations we're gonna share here are based on TNTP summer school content recommendations for ELA. Uh, if teachers will have completed the scope and sequence of instruction, we would recommend the following approach. So the first and most important thing to do is to reinforce grade level learning with a strategic review of the most critical foundational reading skills from the exiting grade. And that should ideally take about 60 minutes a day. This should include explicit instruction focused on the foundational skills that are pr uh, critical prerequisites for future learning followed by student practice both in and out of context of connected text. So for example, students may practice segmenting or blending a new letter sound and then have the opportunity to practice reading a decodable that um, has those same skills targeted. Uh, the content can come directly from the district's adopted curricula by identifying the lessons where those critical foundational skills are taught and practiced. And you can also use end of year assessment data to inform a more targeted review of skills that are identified as common gaps. So for example, you might prioritize the following skills by grade level. Uh, for kindergarten, it's really critical that students know how to read and spell words with short vowels and consonants and short vowels and digraphs. In first grade, it is really critical for students to be able to read and spell words with consonant blends with the magic E, with long vowel patterns, and with R-controlled vowels. For second grade, it's really critical for students to be able to read and spell multisyllabic words. In ensuring that our students leave summer school with a mastery of those prerequisite skills, we'll set them up for success in the upcoming school year and ensure that they're not entering with gaps. Now, the other key focus area uh, should be on accelerating learning and building student confidence by building knowledge and vocabulary to support access to the upcoming year's content. And you should spend about 60 minutes a day on this as well. So basically front loading some of the key background knowledge and vocabulary that students are going to see in the upcoming year. Summer learning presents an opportunity to continue the work of engaging students in complex text, evidence-based discussions, and evidence-based writing tasks that will deepen their literacy skills and build their background knowledge and vocabulary. We recommend prioritizing text-based instruction that will build background knowledge and vocabulary to support access to the topics explored in the next year's scope and sequence. So for example, exiting second graders would listen to complex read-alouds that will support access to the topics that they'll explore in their third grade curriculum. Uh, this instruction should emphasize the shift uh, in the TN, uh, Tennessee ELA standards to ask for instruction to move away from a strategy-based approach, like finding the main idea, toward a more text and knowledge-based approach with an explicit focus on meaning and details of high-quality, grade-appropriate text. Um, and as far as finding that content, it can come from unused or supplemental portions of the adopted curricula, so a lot of times there will be lists of supplemental texts or suggested novel studies, research modules, et cetera, or they can come from other high quality free and open source knowledge building and comprehension curricula, uh, such as core knowledge history and geography units or core knowledge science units. Those are both free, um, really content rich uh, resources, and we will share links to those in the materials we share after this webinar. Now for upper level ELA, our recommended approach is very similar. Uh, summer learning presents an opportunity to continue the work of engaging students in grade level tech 
evidence-based discussions and evidence-based writing that will deepen their literacy skills and build background knowledge and vocabulary. Uh, for this reason, it is again recommended to focus on accelerating learning and building student confidence by building knowledge and vocabulary to support access to next year's content. And that should take about 60 to 90 minutes a day. Um, we recommend prioritizing text-based instruction that will build background knowledge and vocabulary to again support the learning that they'll be doing in that next year. Um, content for this can again come from unused or supplemental portions of your adopted curricula, or we'll have some recommendations for other free and open source knowledge building and comprehension curricula that you might consider. And then the other portion of ELA, since we don't have that foundational skills portion in the upper grades, uh, we do know that even in upper elementary and middle school grades, there will still be students who struggle because they fail to master those foundational literacy skills. And for that reason, we would recommend at, at least some time, maybe 30 to 60 minutes a day, uh, be devoted to reinforcing students' foundational literacy skills with strategic review of skills like grammar, morphology, spelling, and of course, lots of fluency practice. Summer school instruction should identify the most critical grade appropriate foundational skills uh, practice from the exiting grades curriculum and incorporate that instruction and practice into the summer school scope and sequence. Uh, setting aside small amounts of time in daily instruction to practice reading fluency can make a huge difference for students. Classroom strategies for increasing fluency can be employed using text passages that are uh, part of your existing curriculum, or you may choose to supplement with some other text and we'll have some examples of that um, that we'll share in our follow-up materials. But one of them, Achieve the Core, has great open source pa passages that can be used in fluency building, as well as some reading practice activities that are designed to support growth in all three areas of fluency, including accuracy, rate, and expression. Uh, these activities also include detailed guidance on how and when to implement them, uh, and when to implement research-based activities such as model reading, choral reading, independent practice, and student performance to build fluency skills. And then lastly, one other resource we'll share, Hasbrook and Tyndall have a quick reference chart that can help teachers identify readers who need that fluency support, help them set goals, and then track progress. And again, we'll share links to those in our follow-up materials. Um, I'm going to start to sound like a broken record, but for ELA intervention, we would also recommend leveraging your high quality instructional materials, as many of them include tools that point teachers to portions of prior grade level lessons that can be used to target gaps. Um, we encourage educators to use pre-assessment data to determine what gaps exist for groups of students and then study if and how those gaps relate to the content of the next year. Um, that will help you understand whether they can be addressed alongside um, upcoming material or if that learning must come before, and then enable teachers to plan for differentiated instruction to address some of those prerequisite gaps. Um, teachers should provide targeted remediation and reinforcement with priority content, particularly foundational literacy skills, but in an intervention blog that will be done with just a small group of students. Um, and so this should focus in K2 on those most commonly taught skills like phonics, phonemic awareness, and fluency. And because we know if students lack those skills, they're likely to struggle with all other uh, reading comprehension tasks. And so that means that uh, educators will need to prioritize those. But uh, in the upper grades, remember that while poor code knowledge is often at the root of many reading problems, some students may experience reading difficulty for other reasons. For example, students who are learning English may have mastered the requisite decoding skills, but they may not have a sufficient understanding of the meaning of English words to make sense of what they read. And so those problems may, be need to, may need to be addressed with other resources that will help them build that critical background knowledge and vocabulary. Now, shifting gears to math, um, these are also based on TTP summer school content recommendations, which again, we'll share after this webinar. But if teachers have completed the scope and sequence for math, we would recommend the following approach. Um, at least 30 minutes a day should be spent on reinforcing grade level learning and fl with fluency builders. And then additional time in practice with standards that call for fluency. Um, those will build on students' conceptual understanding and help them to solidify their math facts while maintaining that coherence in the standards. Teachers should ensure that this work is focused on the fluency expectations uh, for the grade level students have just completed and not on the grade level standards that target the more conceptual understandings or application. 
Most high quality instructional materials have clearly identified fluency gains and practice activities that target the major work of the grade. Um, and then Student Achievement Partners has also compiled a list of fluency resources that are pulled from Eureka Math and Illustrative Math to open education resources for grades K-5, and we'll share those in our resource guide. But remember that the time spent on fluency practice should be fun and energizing for students. Uh, the majority of time in math, at least 60 minutes a day, should be spent accelerating learning and building student confidence by previewing the first module of next year's high quality instructional materials. So um, naming and giving strug struggling students a preview of next year's content will help them believe in their ability to learn. It will equip them with effective problem solving strategies and it will build their confidence and self-efficacy. Teachers can follow the first unit or module as written, but at a slower pace to allow for targeted reinforcement and just-in-time supports to address any unfinished learning. It will be critical for teachers to position summer school students as leaders who will be ready to support other students next year because they've already had the opportunity to explore the content. And this approach will support the development of students' mathematical identity, agency, and belonging. Lastly, teachers should provide targeted reinforcement with just-in-time support, which will likely take about 30 minutes a day. As they work to accelerate students' progress with the first unit or module, teachers can plan and provide that just-in-time just reinforcement to catch kids up on the most critical content of the grade they just finished and set the foundation for a strong start for the next school year. So for example, in third grade, the first unit in the Eureka curriculum is focused on introducing multiplication and division. Um, as students engage in these new ideas, teachers can strategically integrate opportunities to reinforce their work with addition and subtraction from the prior grade. Um, the guidance for math intervention is similar to the guidance for ELA intervention. Teachers should provide that targeted remediation and reinforcement, but just do so in a small group of students. It's really critical for, interve for intervention to leverage pre-assessment data to determine specifically the unfinished learning students have from prior grades and to study how and if those gaps relate to content for the next year. For tier one and tier two students, uh, they may just need targeted reinforcement with specific skills, and we encourage educators to leverage their high-quality instruction materials for instruction to provide that continuity of experience. I'm now going to turn things back over to Sharon so that she can move us along in our agenda. Thank you, Courtney, for sharing that breadth of information. Uh, as Courtney noted, we will be sharing a resource document with attendees after today's webinar summarizing the content that Courtney just walked us through. We know it's a lot. Now we're going to hear from some Tennessee districts that have been working to put these recommendations into practice. First up, we have Dr. Clint Satterfield, Director of Schools for Trousdale County Schools, who's here to share how his team is leveraging their core knowledge language arts CKLA materials to address learning loss and accelerate learning for graduating kindergarten through um, uh, grade two students. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Roberts. Um, first of all, I think from where we started, we're on a hybrid system and we have done that all year long. So our students are only in person two days a week. One of the things I think the principal did really strategically is they taught two foundational skills lessons uh, per week. So as we look at where we're finishing the year and going into the summer, is we feel like we're on track with our foundational skills strand, but a little bit behind in the listening learning strand but we feel like that's a good place to, uh, to start. Uh, this first PowerPoint is one of the things that we did is we applied for a waiver. We wanted to get our summer learning camp and our learning loss bridge camp on the, uh, on the same schedule, basically for transportation. And also, you know, families overlap those grade spans. Uh, one of the things that we were concerned about from the beginning is, as you know, that everybody uh, is running on fumes uh, from this uh, school year. And the last thing that we wanted to do was burn out our teachers and our students by adding more summer school or that type of thing on. So we wanted to make it palatable. Uh, we had our principals go out and talk to our highly qualified teachers 
we knew that we had to get our best teachers on board in order to give this an opportunity to be effective. And one of the things that we heard from our, uh, our teachers is they didn't want to work on Friday and neither does the students. We kind of learned that from the read to be ready time that our participation was down on, on Friday. So we, we chose to do four days a week for six hours. Uh, we put our stream education in our after school program. And I, I maybe I can talk about that in a minute. But uh, in order to do that, we prioritized that we would have uh, 90 minutes of ELA instruction, 90 minutes of math, and 30 minutes of intervention in each one of those content, in each one of those content areas. Another thing that we wanted to do was uh, to eliminate barriers and we wanted to be sure that uh, that we provided child care. So we, in our community, uh, a lot of our student, I mean, a lot of our parents work outside the county. And by letting our kids out at 12, 30 or one o'clock, they just didn't have a way to pick children up. So we are providing an after school care for, for in the afternoons where we'll keep their students till 5.30 in the afternoon. And that's where we put our, our stream count uh, as well. Another thing that we've done is a little bit different is we've tried to prioritize attendance. And uh, we have told our parents that if, uh, if you can't make 90% of the time, then you might wanna give these limited seats to somebody else. But one of the things that we wanted to do to get the students who uh, wanted to come, who could come, where we could make results uh, over the summer. Uh, they, she flipped over to the, uh, the second slide there. The main, one of the first things that we wanted to do was to leverage our high quality instructional materials, our CKLA materials that we've been using for four or five years. Our teachers have a great deal of familiarity with, uh, with those materials. And we chose to use those materials, one, because they're high quality, two, that our teachers are familiar with those materials and they know how to use them. And then also is it was gonna save us a lot of, of training time because we're gonna start our summer camp on June the 1st. We graduate on the 21st of May. There's just not a lot of room uh, for, for training at that time. The next one is we want to introduce our grade level learning with a strategic view of the most critical foundational skills required for entering the next grade. So the main thing that we wanted to do here was, uh, let me think about that for a minute, is we wanted to uh, a strategic review of the most critical foundational skills. So what we wanted to do is right now they're working with our students. They're using Dibbles testing. They're using end of unit assessments and trying to find exactly where our students are. And then they're collecting that data and those data points so that we will be able to group students accordingly during the summer school and be able to provide strategic uh, interventions and address the skill deficits area where those students exist. The next thing that was really big for us is the third bullet was the, the concept of, uh, of accelerating learning. Uh, one of the things I know that probably everybody in the state is doing is we're promoting our students. So our second grade students are going to the third grade. Our third grade students are going to the fourth grade. And in order to recruit parents, we just didn't want it to be, and this is a big selling point in our community and with our parents is, this is not your old typical summer school where you're gonna make up all of what you missed during the year. So we wanna talk to our parents about accelerating learning that we're giving them on grade level, on grade level content. We're working strongly with tier one materials most of the time. We want to give our students a head start uh, at school. We want to build a great deal of a, uh, confidence using the building schema and vocabulary and content knowledge. Those things that students who
who are already behind, who are going to be promoted into the next grade, needs to have a great deal of confidence when they come into those classrooms in the fall. So the idea of uh, learning acceleration uh, is very important with us. Sometimes that may seem like a paradox or oxymoron, so to speak, in the sense that even though we're giving them grade level material and we find out what students are missing, then we have to plug in the gaps as we go along, but we just don't want it to be a repeat of, of the prior grade. The next thing that we're spending a lot of time with is we're doing a pilot right now and SCORE has helped us with this and TNTP has helped us a great deal, is doing a lot of work with the high dose or high impact tutoring concept. What we're doing right now in the first grade is we're taking, our, uh, taking one teacher and an EA and we're pushing them in with four students and we're giving them, uh, so it's a, it's a two to one ratio. They're targeting deficit skills. We're meeting those criteria of 30 minutes a day, uh, in person, face to face. We are doing a heavy job of collecting data on a weekly basis, spending a lot of time with the CKLA uh, end of unit assessment, the Dibble screeners, and then really hitting those skill er uh, deficit areas. And we are, have already seen a great deal of growth. So we're field testing that in the first grade. We're going to roll that up into the first and second grade in our summer camps. And then that is the model that we are working toward in the fall and giving some of our teachers and some of our EAs opportunities to work with this type of RTI model where we're pushing in, we're working with the teacher of record, we're uh, getting familiar with the CK assessment and remediation guide, but we have also found out some things already that's important about this concept is that uh, the planning time with the teachers and the interventionist is, is imperative and that also that we're going to need uh, more extensive training with getting to know and learning how to use the assessment and rem remediation guide. So I think uh, the, you know, just as we're going into this uh, for the summer, I think what we're thinking about is the training of staff, even though we're using uh, curriculum that we're familiar with, that it's going to take a, take a little bit of time. We're going to use the last week of school to, uh, to train our teachers. Uh, again, rolling back to what I said earlier is we thought it was imperative that we recruited the best teachers, the, highly, the, high, the most highly effective teachers that we had. We went around asking them this question, Sharon laughs at me when I say this, but asking the, the teachers, what will it take to get you out of the swimming pool uh, this summer? So we went in and looked at the law and we tried to pay, we, we paid our teachers the highest amount we could uh, I think we're paying our teachers $42 an hour. And then we also use some of our ESSER funds to give teachers bonuses. You know, I know that sometimes people talk about like they're gonna split the class up. One teacher is gonna teach it for six weeks. And, I mean, for three weeks, another teacher would teach it for three. We did not, we didn't think that was, was really the best way to go about working with the students that are the furthest behind by giving them two, teach, two different teachers. and the teachers not knowing where they are in such a short period of time. So we gave our teachers a bonus and we scaffold that bonus. So like you make like $850 if you don't miss any days and then like 645 if you miss one, 430 if you miss uh, like two and 215 if you miss three. So uh, we've really got a lot of good teacher uh, participation. I think we've got 90% of our top teachers really excited about. I think our teachers are excited about that. And then not having to come on Friday has been huge. We're providing bus transportation for all of our students. And again, uh, summer daycare to 530. And it, presently we've have about 75% of our students have already registered online. And uh, we think we're gonna uh, be able to fill all the seats that we have. And uh, 
uh, we've got a lot, a lot to do yet, but we've come a long ways as well. Thank That's you, Clint. Thank you so much, Clint. There's so much wrapped up into that uh, that I know people are going to be excited and thinking about that. Um, you've been so strategic in recruitment of teachers and how do you use your time and how do you use your materials and uh, focusing on acceleration. And I can't wait to see what happens more from your pilot with this high dosage tutoring. So can't wait to learn more from you. Um, next, we're going to hear from Lauren Effler, who is supervisor of pre-K-12 curriculum and instruction for Union County Schools, who's here to share how her team is le leveraging their wit and wisdom materials to address learning loss and accelerate learning for graduating third through seventh graders. Hi everyone, um, I am Lauren Effler, like she said, from Union County Schools, so thank you all for letting me come and uh, talk about what we're doing in Union County. Um, what you'll see on your screen right now is we, just like Clint said, we applied for the waiver. We wanted our learning camp and our bridge camp um, to be at the same time for our families so there wouldn't be any confusion or hardship with the, um, the time or the days or the weeks that we would be providing a summer programming. And we were able to receive that waiver. So we are four days a week. And just like Clint, we figured out pretty um, quickly that our teachers needed a little bit of break. Um, so we are doing the Monday through Thursday. That Friday is really important to them um, to spend time with their families as well. And um, our kids like to have a little break too in the summer. So we're doing the Monday through Thursday, four days a week. We actually have, um, it says six hours, but we've actually have seven hours of daily programming. We decided to go from 8.30 to 3.30. So it would look like um, somewhat of a traditional day that our kids were used to seeing. And in that time, we have the two hours of ELA, the two hours of math. We have one hour of intervention or enrichment opportunity. Um, one hour of a lunch and learn and then a brain break. So basically that's our lunch time and um, our recess time. And then one hour of stream. So we've incorporated that um, into our daily programming and we have kind of done that in a strategic way that um, I'll talk about when we get to the next um, slide. Perfect. Um, so our summer school goals is we really wanted to leverage our high quality instructional materials. I know Clint was saying that they have used CKLA for a number of years. And like Clint in our K2 classrooms, we are using CKLA this year. And Wit and Wisdom, we are using in grades three through eight. And this is our first year of implementing um, these high quality instructional materials. And we're very excited about them. Um, but for a number of reasons, um, the pandemic of course being a major reason, um, we did not get finished with our scope and sequence this year. <clears throat> so the way Wit and Wisdom is set up, you have a module zero, and then you have modules one through four. And our teachers are going to finish module zero, module one, and module two um, before the traditional school year ends. So we wanted to be able to pick up right where we left off and begin our module three for our summer programming. And we are starting June 1st, and just like Trousdale, we're going June 1st through June 24th. So that doesn't give a lot of time um, to really retrain teachers or train them on some additional materials that we wouldn't want to do anyway. Our teachers were extremely excited to have the extra time to really, um, really hone in on their craft more with wit and wisdom. And since it's still new to them, they are excited about being able to dive in this year and really work on um, module three with their students that they weren't able to do or won't be able to complete um, before we graduate in May or move to the next school year. So we really wanted to leverage those high quality materials, um, really wanna accelerate our student learning during summer school. 
I'm sure like many of you, we have um, the summer slide. And so we really wanted to keep our students engaged in learning. Um, we really obviously um, want to give them a safe place that they can come to. Our summer programming is going to have our transportation, breakfast, lunch, and uh, just an additional way to get them in there. We are providing snacks and goodies um, to our kids that they can um, eat at school or they can take home and share with their families if needed. And we're working with our family resources um, center to make sure that our kids that are not only at summer school, but definitely for those ones that are at summer school, that they're able to go home with the food and supplies that they need. Um, throughout their days. So once we decided we wanted to use our Wit and Wisdom instructional materials, we like Clint needed the best teachers to make this happen for us. Um, we were really worried that we were gonna have teachers that were a little bit burnt out, um, a little bit just wanting to take a break after this year. And we really did not have that happen. Um, Thank the good Lord, something was, uh, he was looking out for us, but we had teachers so excited um, about summer school, about offering this opportunity for their students, learning more about their curriculum since it's new to us this year. Um, so we were really excited. We have our ELA teachers for every single grade level, um, third grade through eighth grade, that have said yes we want to teach summer school. We are ready, we want to teach it. Um, so I love their excitement about it. I'm excited about it. We have, um, we've been doing the Read to Be Ready programs for the last several years as well. So um, our teachers are just excited to work. Our big thing in the summer is we really wanted to, one, be able to pick up where we left off offer those to our students, those high quality instructional materials that are so, so important to them and really be able to utilize our writing. We wanted to be able to um, let our students really hone in and provide them with what they needed for those high quality writing skills. And we noticed that we would not be able to get to some of the writing during the traditional school year. So fifth grade, um, is one of those and it's opinion writing and we were going to absolutely miss the mark this year on opinion writing. Um, our kids are in school four days a week and then they do uh, virtual learning on Wednesdays um, and that's because we have some distance learners and so we wanted to offer time for our teachers and those distance learners to be able to come in um, much smaller population to do any of their testing, one-on-one -on -one time, intervention, remediation, anything that was needed. So our students are essentially at school 80% of the time and then they're doing distance learning on those Wednesdays. So with that being said, we knew that we were going to miss some of those um, great concepts for writing and our kids have enjoyed wit and wisdom, they've enjoyed the books, they've enjoyed the materials, but our teachers have noticed, and I believe it's going from regular materials to high quality materials, that we've missed the mark a little bit with our writing. We're, we really are gonna have to pick up our writing some. And so that is what we're working on with our opinion writing. Um, and I know I told you all that I would get back to what we're doing with stream. So I just want to tell you that really quickly. We are using our stream time to piggyback off of our writing. So for fifth grade, um, they're going to write an opinion writing on The Boys' War by Jim Murphy. If you haven't read that, it's excellent. It's basically about kids going to the Civil War and fighting in the Civil War. Um, we're actually going to use stream time for our students to create man-made materials and then also um, resources in nature that would have helped those boys in the Civil War. 
whether it be providing them with clothing or materials that would help in the terrain or um, a structure or something that would help them be able to survive during the Civil War. So we've tried to be creative. Um, our focus is on writing and using our high quality instructional materials. Thank you, Lauren, for sharing. Um, Thanks for showing how a district that's new uh, to using the high quality instructional materials in ELA can, can leverage that for the students, but also for the teachers. I've enjoyed learning about your work. And finally, we're gonna hear from Millicent Smith, Supervisor of Curriculum and Instruction, and Shannon Tufts, K-12 Literacy Specialist from Lenore City Schools, who are here to share how their team is leveraging their EL language arts materials to address learning loss and accelerate learning for graduating kindergartner through seventh graders. Good afternoon, everybody. We're excited to share a little bit of our, our planning and, and where we are um, to this point. We are one of those that said we are well into planning, but we are definitely not there yet. So on our poll. Um, I just wanted to kind of set the stage real quick for what we were thinking, our kind of the why for us behind our planning to, to think about the earlier slides that um, Sharon and Courtney talked about. Um, we were really targeting a specific group of students, prioritizing students that maybe not your traditional old school summer school student. So we're not looking, we, we were trying to find our students that were really just missing a few key components, a little bit of extra time, because we don't like to say learning loss around here, we say time has been lost. And so we wanna make sure those students are able to make up time so that they're ready to go for the next school year. And so our philosophy was a little different in terms of how we prioritized our students and really looked at students who had been quarantined multiple times, but who were just at the cusp and really just needed a little extra time and content to fill some gaps and then accelerate them into the in preparedness for the next school year. So that's kind of our philosophy. And in doing that, we contacted our students and their parents individually to invite them to attend our summer programming. Um, really connecting with them, we found in our high dose tutoring pilot that making that personal connection with kids and parents and explaining why we want to welcome them into school this summer and all the, the exciting things that we're gonna do um, has really, it really makes a difference. Um, it really, the parents really appreciate it. They understand what we're trying to accomplish and why their student was selected, particularly because we are trying to get away from that old school, you failed, so you have to go to summer school mentality. So this is more of an opportunity to to maybe fill gaps, but more importantly, extend and accelerate students who just need more time. Uh, and obviously, we'll be leveraging our high quality materials, which Shannon, I want Shannon to talk about um, specifically. But I think it's really important to be said that why slide that was mentioned at the very beginning has been really important for both our students and our teachers because we too have had great success in recruiting our students which we wanted to focus on that first um, but we've also had a lot of success with our teachers who Dr. Barker has always said our teachers aren't tired of teaching kids they're tired of COVID <laughs> and all of the extra stuff that comes along with that but our teachers are very committed to our students and we found that to be the case when we um, recruited them to serve students during the summer. I mean we've got all kinds of things happening and teachers even our teachers that don't teach a specific um, core content area want to be a part and want to share their expertise and sort of make the summer programming which we're calling Vacation Academy. We're not um, Cube Chevy Chase and uh, Vacation Music but we're calling it Vacation Academy, not summer school, not summer programming, not anything else other than we just want you to come and um, have a really good opportunity to spend more time. We've had kids say they want to spend time with their teachers. They missed the time. that They, they just felt like they haven't had enough time with their teachers to learn and keep going. So we're really excited about that part of it, um, sort of the why and the philosophy behind it. And then we're 
really just so thankful that we have our high quality instructional materials as a foundation and Shannon and um, our math and science instructional coach Sherry Long have worked really hard to leverage the materials that we have in our district already uh, to prepare students during the summer. So I wanted Shannon to share the work that she's been doing to um, get ready for our teachers and our students. So since we're on um, pace to complete our um, scope and sequence for EL, for the sake of coherence and rigor, we really wanted to leverage um, strategically to accelerate student learning. And so we decided to go with the core knowledge science units um, to help build background knowledge for our students and to help them engage in the following year. The great thing about using high quality materials is that when my teachers are looking at this to implement, they already are using those high leverage protocols um, implemented in the classroom every day. So it's going to be a seamless transition for our students in this journey. And we've also worked to pair um, some of the recommended text from EL for those modules with the, with the informational text that, we'll, that the students will be engaging in the core science unit. So for example, um, our first graders that will be in second grade um, will do the plant animal survival unit, which will give them support when they go into second grade with their module um, three and four for pollinators. And so we've pulled texts like Plantzilla and the jelly bean tree so that we keep that balance of informational text as well as literature that students can grapple with, that it's on grade level, that they can apply their knowledge and help to question and discover the world that is around them. Um, we also, um, thinking about our foundational skills, we're going to use this, um, the time to reinforce and help our students solidify those grade level skills that are so important with a strategic and explicit review of the most critical skills from the grade level that they're leaving, as well as giving that time to, to individually address those weaknesses in code knowledge um, with sufficient practice with fluency and comprehension. We've um, chosen some poems from a poetry book that EL recommends, um, Now You See Them, Now You Don't, which are poems about creatures that hide, but the teachers have explicitly gone in and looked for those poems that would support what's happening in the foundational skills. So for first grade, they were looking for those magic E words and the R control so that when they're pulling the students, everything as most is as as integrated as naturally as possible so that everything flows. We've also talked about how we want them in the floor. We want them dirty. I don't want them in the seats. We don't want them on the computers. We want them outside. We want that citizen science approach. We want them to get as hands-on and as active in their learning as possible to make all of these connections come together. For our older students, we've added a book club complement. And so while they're working in small groups, they'll be working on the uh, fluency passages from Achieve the Core, as well as some explicit work with their teachers around word work for morphology and spelling. But they'll also, like for example, eighth grade will be reading Call of the Wild. And so we've even found poems in the other, while we are digging around that will support what the teacher will do in eighth grade as well to build in some of those word work and other activities. Thank and you. Sharon, I'll just add one thing. Our stream sure. activities will also connect the science and English language arts content. And we are using ready, cl ready classroom materials for our mathematics for all of ours. So really building on all of the core content that we focus on during the school year, students will just be building on that throughout the summer. Great. Thank you, Millicent and Shannon, for walking us through your planning for the summer and what you're working on. I love your positive approach to it, and I've always loved how you approach it as Tom Lost approach. Um, so outlines for each district case study will be shared with attendees after the webinar today. As you can tell, there's a lot of things that they're doing, just like all of you are doing lots of things, and we want to share resources that'll be helpful. Um, after hearing today's presentation, I want you to take a minute to gauge which of the elements that we've discussed that feels the most challenging to implement. Take a moment to respond to the poll on your screen. Question, which of the following feels the most challenging in leveraging high quality instructional materials during summer learning? 
applying these learnings to other subject areas, planning scope and sequence, ongoing training of teachers and staff, compiling and organizing materials for instruction, or balancing review and acceleration instruction. You'll make your choice and submit it, and let's see the poll results. All right, um, it appears as if compiling and organizing for instruction is the greatest, but you know, pretty equally on planning scope and sequence and ongoing trainings of teachers and staff. Um, so thank you for, for sharing that, for participating. For those of you who may be interested in additional support or problem solving help, there'll be a survey opportunity at the end of the webinar. Don't miss it if you're interested. To express interest in one on one consulting support from SCORE and national experts. Thank you again to all of our districts for sharing how you're planning for summer learning and leveraging high quality instructional materials. Now we're going to move into a Q&A session with our districts moderated by Courtney Bell. We've received a few questions throughout our program, but please con continue to submit those questions using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And I'm turning it over to Courtney now. Thank you so much, Karen. Um, so to kick us off, uh, I wanted to start, we got a great question in the chat around um, students. They really appreciated that you all have prioritized the student and teacher attendance but wondering um, to what extent there have been students who have been shut out from this opportunity due to not enough seats, or if it feels like you all are gonna be able to serve um, any and all students who want to take uh, part in this uh, opportunity. Um, I'll jump in on this because this has been a very pleasant um, surprise for us because we have taken the personalized approach to talking to our families when we call and invite families. We may have identified a student at one of our schools, but when we call, it turns out they have a sibling or multiple siblings and maybe a lower grade or an upper grade. And they've asked, can I send them to? And we've said, yes. Um, we want to be able to provide A, that service to the family, but also um, we want students who are you know, supported in doing this work during the summer. We want to support them, recognize the family uh, interest in getting that extra time for their students. So to the extent possible, we are going to supplement our dollars if we need to, to make sure we're able to serve all the students that want to be there. Clint or Lauren, what about y'all? And Clint, you are on mute. Okay, I'm sorry. What about that? Can you hear me now? You got me? Can you hear me now? We got gotcha. you. Yes, okay, good. Uh, you know, just being a superintendent a little bit and, you know, worrying about budgets and in the first year, you know, a little concerned about the state and then the, uh, the TANF uh, funding piece and not knowing exactly how that's going to work out. You know, we we thought we would be better off in the first year uh, going slow and uh, not getting overextended and being sure that we do a really good job with a few things in the first year so that we can uh, build family confidence and student enthusiasm, you know, for many years to come. So one of the things you know, that we ask them for is, is, you know, of course they can sign up any way they want to, but we just ask them, you know, uh, in parent teacher conference, that's where we really got granular, much like Millicent is when we had our parent teacher conference, uh, we had every one of our teachers reach out to every family, talk to them explicitly about the summer learning camp, what that encompassed. And uh, we started an online registration but really just try to encourage them, you know, that we, we don't have but 19 days of instruction and we wanted those days to count and be beneficial and not take up seats of, uh, you know, we had a lot of people say, well, I'm gonna go to camp and then I'm gonna go to vacation and they were gonna be out more than they were gonna be in. 
And you know, the state is doing some type of pre and post assessment. We don't know what that looks like, but we wanted to be sure that we gave our teachers and our students an opportunity, uh, you know, to be successful. And that, that was kind of, you know, our thinking. Now, what, right now we've only have, we got eight grade levels. We've only got two of them that are, are, are full. And uh, hopefully we want to fill 28 in each grade level. And we'll just have to see that go. I, I'm kind of like Millicent. Uh, we don't want to turn anybody back. So I'm sure if we get 30 or 35 in a grade level, you know, we'll figure out a way, you know, to make that happen for us. But I, I don't see us turning away, uh, you know, families who want to be there and who's going to work while they're there. Great. And Lauren, I'd love to hear from you too. And then I'm going to add one more question on for you that we got in the chat. Um, so I would love to hear first if you all um, anticipate having to turn students away or if you think you'll be able to serve all of them. And then secondly, um, since you spoke about the writing emphasis you all are uh, going to have this summer, is that built into the Wit and Wisdom curriculum or is that something that you all are developing on your own? Um, so we went with the approach, um, kind of come one, come all, if you will. Um, we're having a ratio for teachers, like a one to eight ratio. So eight students per teacher. We're really excited about that. We've had some parents reach out and say, we might be going on vacation. Um, if we have um, some split parenting, one week they may be with their mom, the next week with their dad. And both of them may not be aligned to having them at summer school. And we said, come on, um, we'll, something is better than nothing and we'll take it. We, um, we're also, we're a really small district. So we just wanna make sure we know when our kids are there, no matter how many days from 8.30 to 3.30, um, they're safe, they're being fed, they're getting sent home with meals. Um, so we've not had to turn anybody away, and we actually have teachers, um, staff, anybody, people at central office have said, if you need an additional hand, let us know. Um, we, we don't think we'll have to turn anybody away for that. And then the second part of that is the writing. And yes, the writing goes right along with our module three for wit and wisdom. Um, so we'll continue on with that. The writing piece is fabulous um, in wit and wisdom. It's really high quality. So we're going to continue on and use it. Great. Thank you. Um, we had another question in the chat um, about uh, students who have signed up for camp who may have some discipline concerns in addition to academic concerns and how you are planning on addressing some of those things in summer learning. I don't know if you all have gotten far enough along to think about that, but if anyone has any thoughts on that. And we, we have hired, we have a camp coordinator that we're really sort of, that person is the principal of the Vacation Academy. So um, we don't anticipate having any of those issues because we have really started out from the beginning with this personalized approach and, and having that relationship with the families. But of course, with students and kids and, and you know, you can never say never. So we'll be prepared for that. We'll have our normal discipline protocols in place, but we will have a staff um, at the school and our principal and assistant principal at our middle school where we're hosting the whole academy will be there along with, I think it was mentioned to other central office folks will be there. So we'll be in and out to provide support as well. But we're really trying hard to protect our teachers um, just at an, in a nod to how how overwhelming this this year has been, we really want to protect those teachers. We're paying them, we're paying them well, but we're going to ask them to really focus on teaching um, and learning, and we'll take care of this other stuff, any problems that arise in that way. Courtney, Courtney, uh, we we're doing some of the similar things as well. We we've got a couple of inspiring uh, teachers who inspire to be pr administrators. So we actually hired two principals to uh, to run our summer learning camps. One of them is gonna be like our ELA coordinator and the other one's gonna be our math coordinator. Both are, are 
ELA and math teachers respectively. And, uh, and I think that's a good ratio of administrators to help manage any problems that have come up. But one of the reasons that we did that is we wanted to free our, our elementary and our middle school principals so that they can close up this year and prepare for next year and not have to be burdened with trying to run a summer camp as we're trying to reopen schools in the fall. So very similar to Millicent's thinking as well. Yeah, I really appreciate how y'all are thinking about spreading that burden across and making sure that people are able to focus on the things that are the best and most important use of their time. Um, one last question before we wrap up. I'd love to hear a little bit more about how you all are targeting students for this opportunity. Who are the students that you are really making sure to go the extra mile uh, to try to recruit into these summer learning opportunities? Courtney, I, I can start with that. The first thing, you know, of course, that we did is, you know, have our teachers look at their benchmark data, their screener data, and try to, uh, you know, look at the, the students who, uh, you know, I think Millicent eloquently talked about the ones who had been quarantined a lot, uh, had been sick a great deal, uh, certain, certain extenuating circumstances, but we really tried to get our teachers to recruit specific students that they thought would benefit the most uh, from the from the summer learning camp. So we tried to reach out to those. Uh, another thing that we did, we've done an online registration form. So all the priority students can go online. That, that's, that is time stamped. So we have a, an order, uh, like, you know, a sequence for which they've registered and it's a first come first serve basis. We thought that once they were all priority students that we'd put them all in the same uh, bucket, put them, put them all in the same, put them all in the same bucket together. Oh, I'm getting a new chair here. Awesome. I need one of those. Um, but we just thought that, uh, you know, first come first serve and, uh, and then ask them to uh, attend, you know, make a commitment to be here all summer and, uh, Hopefully that's going to work. Again, we've had 75% of our people sign up already, and we think we're at a good point until uh, our last registration day is April the 30th. Thank you, Clint. All right, I think I am now going to turn things back over to Sharon, who is going to wrap us up. But thank you again so much to all of our panelists. And again, a reminder, these folks have been generous enough to let us capture down to the specific lessons that they're using from their curriculum. And so we'll be sharing that full scope and sequence for the entirety of their summer learning um, for the ELA curricula that they talked about today. So please look for that and follow up. And with that, I will turn it over to Sharon to close us out. Thank you, Courtney. And thanks again to Dr. Clint Satterfield, Lauren Effler, Millicent Smith, and Shannon Tutts for their presentations and the wonderful discussion we've just had. I'm inspired by the work these districts have done to plan meaningful and impactful learning for students this summer amidst all of the urgent needs that they're juggling. I'm hopeful that others will be able to build on the work that you all have done and that their lift may be just a little lighter because of your willingness to share so openly, so thank you. We've placed a feedback survey for the webinar in the chat and we hope that you'll take that immediately after we conclude so that we can better understand how to support you and your work on behalf of Tennessee students. In this survey, you'll be able to express interest in receiving some one-on-one -on -one consulting support from national experts. We know that you have so many things going on, so we're hopeful that these consultations will support you in your thinking and will help you leverage your high quality instructional materials this summer to accelerate student learning. For those of you who indicate on the survey that you're interested in additional support, we'll be reaching out to you to schedule a time to talk with you and your team. If others find themselves needing support later on, don't hesitate to reach out to me directly at Sharon at tnscore.org. You can find it on our website, as we would love to be a thought partner for you as you plan for this coming summer. You'll also receive an email from us after this webinar that includes a resource document and each district case study discussed today, as well as the slides and a recording from today's presentation. We really look forward to hearing from you, everyone who attended. 
Um, next, at this next year, as we dig in deeply into this work of recovery, we'll be, um, there'll be a series of opportunities to get things right for kids. We have the chance to reimagine the way that we do things so that we emerge from the pandemic with more equitable systems to support all students. I know you're working incredibly hard to ensure that all of our students get exactly what they need. And I know you're tired. Lean on each other, learn from each other, and let SCORE know how we can help. I would like to take a moment and thank Alexis Parker, SCORE's research and data analyst for her leadership in planning this SCORE Institute. And again, I thank you for joining us today. And I thank you for the work you do every single day for Tennessee students. I hope you have a great rest of the week.